Good evening, everyone. My name is Inakshi Sopti, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Asia Society India Center. It's wonderful to see members, patrons, and friends from across the world join us for this very special conversation between noted academic Dr. Vishakha Desai and author Prayag Akbar on Vishakha's new book, World is Family, A Journey of Multi-Rooted Belongings a memoir based on her life experiences that explores the significance of living globally and its urgency for our current moment. For those of you joining us for the first time, Asia Society is a leading educational organization dedicated to navigating shared futures for Asia and the world. With 13 global centers across the world, our programs build awareness and initiate critical dialogue across the fields of policy, business, arts and culture, education, sustainability and technology. Much of our work is developed through partnerships with other like-minded organizations. And the program today is the second in our ongoing collaboration with Kriya University. Kriya is a liberal arts and sciences private university located in Andhra Pradesh, India, that is committed to holistic higher education and believes in the practice of interwoven learning and we are delighted to be partnering with them for this timely and relevant discussion today. These are difficult times for our country as it battles a monumental public health crisis. Our country's medical professionals, frontline workers, and essential service providers are showing exceptional courage in these times, and they have our deepest respect. Reflecting solidarity and goodwill, the global community has extended a helping hand in supporting the efforts of India in the collective fight against COVID-19. As Vishakha's book iterates, the Vedic phrase, Vasudhaiva Kutambakam, teaches us to treat the world as a family. A message of compassion more necessary than ever today, as we explore what it means to be a global citizen while remaining rooted in the local. And now for some housekeeping before we introduce our speakers this evening, we encourage our audience to post questions or comments in the Q&A box through the program so our panelists can respond to them as they come in. For our audiences on Facebook, please drop them in the comments section. And with that, I'd like to invite Firoza Godridge, board member of the Asia Society, joining us in the studio this evening to introduce our esteemed speakers. Firoza. Thank you, Inakshi, and welcome everyone. As Inakshi said, my name is Feroza Godrej. I'm a board member for the Asia Society India Center. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce our esteemed speakers today. Dr. Vishakha Desai, whom I've had the privilege of knowing for many, many years now, really needs no introduction, but I will do my best, Vishakha. Vishakha is a senior advisor for global affairs to the president of Columbia University and a senior research scholar in global studies at its School of International and Public Affairs and chair of the Committee on Global Thought. From 1990 to 2012, Vishaka held a variety of positions at the Asia Society, initially as the director of the Asia Society Museum and for the last eight years as president and CEO. And that's when I really, really got to know Vishakha. Under her leadership as president of Asia Society, she expanded the society's reach in Asia through innovative programs and through the establishment of new centers in the region. Vishakha donned many hats today, among which is her incredible role as a member of the Academic and Governing Councils of Kriya University, slated to be one of India's top private liberal arts universities. In addition to several, several publications, Dr. Desai is also a frequent contributor to newspapers and magazines in both the US and Asia, and is a prolific speaker at many, many events. And we are delighted to be hosting this discussion around her new memoir, World as Family. Welcome, Vishaka, home away from home at the Asia Society India Center. And now Prayag Akbar. 
alumnus of the London School of Economics, is currently visiting senior fellow at the Center for Writing and Pedagogy, School of Interwoven Arts and Sciences at the Korea University. He is the author of a critically acclaimed work of fiction, Leela, which has won several prizes and was also adapted into a series by Netflix. Prayag has worked as a journalist in a number of leading Indian publications. He was a consulting editor with Mint, a leading Indian financial newspaper, and before that was the deputy editor of the news website Scroll, where he was an early member of this prestigious team. Thank you, Vishaka, and thank you, Prayag, for joining us today. To echo Inakshi, India is really going through an immensely difficult time. It is important that we, as individuals and we, as institutions, support our frontline workers and those who need us. In a campaign called Hashtag In This Together, Asia Society India Center has put together a list of verified organizations doing relief work on ground in India. I urge you all to take a look, contribute, and share this list with friends and family that wish to help. And now, without much further ado, I hand this over to Prayag. Enjoy the evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you all for joining us this evening. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Godred, Ms. Sothi. Um, that was really lovely to have your introductions. Um, and thank you so much, Dr. Desai, for you know making the time to do this today. It was uh, it's really an honor that uh, I get to be in conversation with you, and um, you know and, and that we get to discuss your fantastic book because I, you know, I wasn't sure what to expect when I started reading it, and it was uh, you know it was as I told you as we when we discussed this before it was really a pleasure to read. I thought uh, you know the way you've built your arguments that, that you're building that you're trying to make about about how the world is. Uh, you know, you've done it in a very, uh, in, in, in a way that I think is very impactful for many, many readers across, uh, across the globe. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, we, uh, well, I think we can start with the question and answer now. Uh, so, you know, as, as you know, from the introductions, from uh, what Ms. Sobti said, what Ms. Godred said, um, you know, we, it's almost impossible to ignore what's going on around us right now, which is the pandemic, you know, which is this, um, truly, you know, momentous kind of experience that we're all going through. And, um, you know, much of World of world as Family was written actually before the pandemic. Uh, you know, when you mentioned this, and it was written before this pandemic totally upturned our lives and the way we experience the world, the way we do these kind of interactions. Um, your country of residence, uh, the United States, faced a brunt last year, and we uh, in India, going through this right now, you know, in a very, very tragic way. Um, how do you think your book, which has this, you know, uh, elegant thesis of world as family, how do you think your book responds to this, uh, to the pandemic? Um, you know, what do you think it has to say in this time? Right. Well, first, Prayag, thank you so much for doing this with me. And, and thank you, Firoza. Thank you, India Center of Asian Society and Korea for doing this because both organizations are really part of my life in India and you keep me connected to India in addition to my family, in addition to my work at the as a board member at Mahindra. So I consider these two institutions very close to my heart. So thank you very much. And Prayag, especially for you, because I'm not a writer by profession. You know, you asked me to write about art history, I can do it. I know how to do the academic work. So this was a real challenge for me, but I put myself through this because I felt that I was getting very worried about how much there was kind of uh, opposition to things global, that actually it was written at a time, if you will, the former president of the United States had clearly stated that if you're a globalist, 
you're anti-nationalist. And this kind of uh, an idea is being around all over the world these days, sometimes for political reasons, sometimes for other kinds of reasons rather than the reality, and sometimes for good reasons. You know, absolutely, there's no question. At the same time, I kept feeling when I was working with young people, especially because I teach at Columbia and I work with exchange students from all over the world as a chair of American Field Service organization. And it occurred to me that young people are really global natives. They seem to feel like the world is in their palm, in their cell phone. They can, can and especially Generation Z is born with all of this, right? And at the same time, they didn't really have any ways to kind of parse out, can you actually think about global and yet be locally rooted? What is all of this? So my intent was to write not an academic book, but a personal book to say, how did I get there? So they in a way encouraged me to say, how did I become so passionate about this whole global thing? What is it? Where did it come from? So it was my, journey and my excavation of my life, if you will, and reflection. But I have to tell you, as you know from the back of the book, that I almost gave up on the title. Initially, I thought about this, you know, Vasudeva Kutumbakam as a title. It's almost like global. It's so cliched. It's so generalized, especially in India, and used for all kinds of political reasons, as if it's abstracted and over there. And then COVID happens. And I said, oh my God, I actually began to think about this phrase in a completely different way. And I recognized that this 3,000 year old phrase is so prescient, so profound, because it actually tells you that you understand this unit of analysis, if you will, in sociology, family. We know what a functional family looks like. Functional family is where you have to think about yourself as an independent person, but in relation to the interdependence of the family. It also tells you that sometimes you have to kind of give up grudges to be able to function as a unit, as a family. How do we apply these principles today in this catastrophic once in a century pandemic and remind ourselves that this will not be the only thing. Climate crisis absolutely reminds us that the climate crisis doesn't know any borders. Pandemic doesn't know any borders. And at the same time, we have to understand that global is not by itself isolated. Global has to be in relation to local, national. So there are things you do in your own community, things you do in your country, things you must think about in the world. It becomes very visceral. So to me, I almost doubled down on the phrase because I recognize that our global family is dysfunctional. We need help. We need help that each one of us has to play a part in how do we think about ourselves as not just being rooted in our community, but bring that community spirit to the larger world. And with the pandemic in India right now and the crisis, which is catastrophic, maddening, very, very difficult to manage, especially when you're this far away, uh, for me, you know, personally, because India is still my home. Nobody can take it away from me. And so two countries I call home, they've managed this pandemic in very different ways and yet similar ways at sometimes. And it is therefore reminds you that when 40 countries come to the aid of India, it isn't just because it's a moral thing to do. It's also because we are all interdependent. This crisis that's in India is not going to just stay in India as we learn about the pandemic itself. Secondly, India being one of the largest producers of vaccines. If India can't produce vaccines that it has promised other people, it is going to affect everybody else. So it kind of brings up this intellectual or somewhat abstracted idea of global right in our home. As I say in the epilogue that the world lives in our body through the pathogens, you know, so we have to really work harder to figure out how to actually do this.
Well, I mean, there is something that you did point out in your epilogue that uh, this could have been, at least the first year of the pandemic, this could have been a, you know, a real moment of globalism. This could have been the globalist moment that the world needed or you know, to reinforce those ideas. But instead, I'm going to quote you here. It said, you said there was a complete lack of coordination in dealing with the crisis. So, um, you know, what do you think led to that failure to coordinate between countries? What do you think the forces were that were acting here? Well, you know, there's another organization that I belong to that we actually developed in the middle of the crisis called One Shared World. And we just did a program with Kiran Chamajumdar and the head of WHO. And it's very clear that two things or three things that we need, should remember. One is that the institutions that are international institutions that came of age after World War II actually are all based still on the national sovereignty and then doing something in the world. They're not based on the principle of interdependence completely. It is to stop the wars, you know, okay, we know how to do that. The second piece is that all of those institutions are starved for resources. So WHO, it's very clear. I mean, and of course, the former president of the United States decided that he was going to get out of WHO. So at the time when we needed to support that is when people were going the other way, because it is true that when things get difficult, either you go through that challenge and come the other way, or you hold on to the little things you have. And I think that there is something about, and I understand it's sometimes natural that you want to hold on when you get scared, but you also have to learn to go through that. And I think that what we're realizing is that our global or international institutions are not set up for this idea of the interdependence that the world is part of. And therefore we have to support that, but we also have to think about it at every step of the way. So whatever you do locally, even for this pandemic, you have to understand that you're part of this larger community. So for me, philosophically, what it has really brought up is that because of this focus on the self and the individual, which is important, it's a very Euro-American kind of an idea, enlightenment idea that we need to focus on, no question about that. But it has to be in relation to our collective self and our collective responsibilities. How do we teach that to our children, to our students, so that both pieces are in kind of equal weight? In India, sometimes I feel that we go too far into the collective, not enough of the self. In America, you go too far in the self and not enough in the collective. So I just see both sides that we have to think about independence in relation to interdependence. And that's a philosophical concept that we have to really embrace in much stronger way. Thank you. Uh, I, I do. I think there's a few questions from the audience, um, uh, which uh, I like Modit Jain's question, which is, uh, I don't know if you can see these, but uh, he says, has the pandemic shown the world as a family? I suppose we've been discussing uh, pretty much this in a sense, but you know, it's quite, uh, it's an interesting question. Do, do you think it has it or not? Well, I would say that the pandemic has shown that the world is a family, but it's a dysfunctional family. Right. And so what we need to do is to make it more functional. We have to repair and heal this world. So it shows in absolutely spades, if you will, it's something that starts in one country, how quickly it comes to another country. And before you know it, you don't even know how to control it. Because as I, as in fact, a number of people have said, pathogens don't know any borders. But how we deal with the pandemics depends on what we do. And therefore, it is at the national, local and the global level. So in America, sometimes we say that you have to chew gum and walk at the same time. We have to learn to think local, national, and global at the same time. We don't have a choice. I mean, um, I, it's kind of links to what you were talking about because, uh, uh, you know, the experience of even within countries, it's not just uh, at, a, at a global level, but even within countries, the experience of different ethnicities, of the pandemic has been, you know, vastly different. Uh, as you know, Native Americans in 
in the United States, uh, in India, you know, um, uh, disprivileged communities, there's a class dimension to it, an ethnic dimension right. to it. Um, uh, do you feel that, uh, you know, there's been a failure within, even at, uh, you know, a failure of empathy, perhaps, between, uh, even within countries, it seems like, you know, we seem, we seem to be seeing that where now numbers are sort of receding in the cities here, but the problem is being pushed out into rural India and everyone is kind of blinkering themselves again and thinking that this won't come back and bite us. Well, you know, uh, you know, uh, and that's exactly it that I think that it's very, very clear that what happens is that we want to protect ourselves. And what mm -hmm. the pandemic reminds you is that protecting yourself by itself is never going to work. Mm -hmm. You have to think about the broader dimension. And the second part is that if anything, the pandemic has really shown again in stark relief what we have known, but have chosen to ignore. And that is the inequities in our system in, in kind of privilege, non-privilege, rural, urban, different minorities. This is the time to recognize that this is shown in sharp relief the problems we have. We've always known it, but we've chosen to ignore it. And now what this does is that you can't ignore it because it will come back to bite you. It's in your selfish interest to actually not ignore it. The question is, can we actually learn that lesson or are we doomed to repeat our mistakes? That is, I suppose we'll see, but I mean, not that anyone wants to go through this again uh, okay. in a lifetime, but yeah, it is, it is, you know, it's it's worth uh, paying attention to to see if we can actually, you know, fund public health, all the all the things that have been so desperate. For me, why I think this world is family idea gets back to the family part of it mm -hmm. and the functional family part of it. I think that and, and that's why I wrote it in a very personal way, because I think that all of these things begin at home in our own families. How do we treat others? How do we treat people around us? How do we actually explore the possibility of expansiveness within a sense of the family? You know, people forget that this particular phrase, Vasudeva Kutumbakam, mm -hmm. comes from a much larger phrase, which I love. And it happens to be in front of our parliament, you know, so it's right there. And that is, that in fact, it goes on, it starts by saying that only those of the limited mind think of the blood relatives as your family. It is the magnanimous ones that understand that the whole world is a family. So treating the world as family is actually going beyond your idea of community within your own little group. And, and this is written 1000 before Christ. I mean, it's like profound, you know, in India, especially when we are so cliquish and so clannish and so, uh, you know, this is mine, this is a different caste. The truth is that the interdependence is understood within that context. So for me, I, I always say that I just feel very blessed to have been born in a family where I learned that from my parents and from my family. I actually, um, I, I, I did want to talk to you a little bit about this because, uh, uh, you know, the, your book has some beautiful descriptions of growing up in Gujarat, uh, of your parents, uh, you know, how much they shaped you. Um, you also mentioned that they actually came from an intercaste union. And do you think that that sort of uh, gave them this kind of more broad minded, they were so broad minded with you while raising you, you know, you can see that in almost every chapter. Uh, do you think that that sort of, uh, you know, contributed to how open-minded they were about things? I, I have to say that I totally feel blessed to have been born in the family. It wasn't my choice, you know, it just happened that way, but um, uh, very much that way. But I also think that it has something to do with the independence movement and the social dimension of it. Now, I don't want to be too romantic. I realize that there are all kinds of issues, but there was something about that idea of coming together from differences and 
making something. My parents did come from a different, uh, two different castes. They didn't get married till my mother was 31, my father was 34. And they went through a lot of iteration of thinking about this and that my mother was involved with one of the first women's institutions in India, Jyoti Sang, that started with Rudula Sarabhai and other people were involved with that as well. So for my mother, the idea of being married was a choice. And she always, and there's a phrase that I use in the book where she, when I wanted to get married, my former husband, uh, my first husband, if you will, and I thought I would just read that passage and what she says to me, uh, which I thought was sort of very interesting, you know. Uh, he was a Peace Corps worker. I was not even 21 yet. And I tell them that I want to get married. And so we kind of broach a subject. They'd met him before. And then we started talking about this. So I said that I wanted to get married right after I graduated from college. I was in Elphinstone. And um, this is what we sit down and we talk about that. So I explained our intent. And Papa responded. It's clear that you love each other, but Nanu, which is my family nickname, you have always thought about going to graduate school in America. I had already been in America as an exchange student, so that's what it is. I suggest you go to the United States for further studies. Why don't you both continue to see each other and even live together to see how you'd feel about being in America as a couple? There's no hurry. You're not even 21 yet. After all, your two older sisters are unmarried and pursuing professional paths. Ben chimed in, that's my mother. I think it's a good idea that if you wait and get to know each other a little better. It's one thing for you to connect in India where Tom, my then uh, fiance or partner, you're a foreigner, but it's quite another for Nanu to learn to be part of your family in America when they haven't even met her yet. I think what Papa is saying is that you could live in the same city while you both complete your education. And Papa corrected her immediately. No, no, no. I do mean that they should live together in the same house and see what it's like to be a couple. After all, they're merging two cultures together and that is no small thing to do. It will take a lot of adjustment on both of their parts. So why not have a trial run, so to speak? Here was father in late 1969 in provincial city of Ahmedabad, suggesting that cohabitation was the best route for Tom and me. When I tell this story to my Indian friends, they're utterly shocked. And my American friends, having fought the battles of cohabitation before marriage with their parents in the same period, are equally surprised. But Papa was true to his character. From his fictional and non-fictional writings dating to the 1930s and 40s, it's clear that he often rebelled against the institution of traditional marriage and promoted alternative lifestyles to pursue true love in the face of social constraints. So I, when, I, when I tell people that they're like, what, 1969? Even in America, nobody did that, you know? So that's pretty out there, right? Amazing. Very progressive. I mean, yeah. if you consider the context, living in Gujarat, you know. Uh, but, uh, anyway, um, I did, you know, I do want to move on from the pandemic, uh, okay. but there's a very good question by one of this, uh, one of my students at Kriya, uh, uh, called Arnav Jalan. He's a very bright boy, a uh, very bright uh, gentleman. Uh, he says, uh, do you think that a lot of the help that is being offered to countries in need is out of empathy? or more as a result of favors. Uh, how can a sense, or, you know, I'll, 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 add, I'll add a bit to that, or more as a res result of fear. Uh, how can a sense of inter interdependence thrive in a capitalist society that we live in? Well, Arnab, thank you for that question. And Arnab is part of One Shared World as well. So I am delighted, Arnab, to uh, hear from you. Um, I think that, there's going to be a mixture of that and it's okay you know whatever it is the reality is that if you just have this kind of moral obligation because you're a human being and you support human beings that's the best but you know what whatever it is if you recognize that if india doesn't come out of this well enough 
it is going to affect everybody else. They need their vaccine. They need to make sure that India is in good. good. I think it's okay because it's going to be a variety of uh, impetuses that people will go to. And I think the reality is that do we come together or not? Now, the bigger question is, can you make a systemic change out of that? Or is this all one off? That is a bigger issue because I think that the systemic change won't really happen until we demand of our countries, our national governments to say, you have to pay attention to what's happening in the world because it's in our interest, not just in geopolitical interest, not just in power based structure, but it is because we demand that we actually are part of this larger world. And that's what Greta Thunberg is saying about climate, you know, that you adults Pay attention. You're giving us a world that is going to be inhabitable and it is not acceptable. That is what needs to happen. So now we're done with pandemic talk. Um, uh, we'll come back, I'm sure, <laughs> because it's unavoidable. Yeah. Uh, but I did want to uh, talk to you a little bit more about uh, you know, your book. And um, you start off with, you start World's Family with this very potent, very uh, evocative image, uh, a banyan tree from your past, which has come for you to symbolize globalization, uh, a personal symbol for multi-rooted belongings that, um, is how you describe it in the book. Can you tell us a little bit, I mean, as a writer, it just appealed to me very much that image. Could you uh, could you tell me a little bit more about, could you tell the audience about what that means to you, the banyan tree and global? Right. Well, you know, how I came to it was actually thinking about it over time and how much I love sitting under, <clears throat> those big trees. And then I was involved with Oroville um, as the International Council member. And Oroville has just the best banyan tree of all banyan trees. It's just amazing. And then being a historian and a study of, of history of art and religion and so forth and so on. And I recognize that, you know, why is banyan tree so powerful both in Hinduism and in Buddhism? Partly because it has this notion where roots become branches and branches become roots, even though there is a kind of central trunk, everything is interchangeable from branches to trees, then they spawn off new trees and that itself. And at the same time, it feels very balanced. It feels very calming when you're sitting there. And when you're sitting under it, there is kind of this, you're aware of the world and the world and the, the wind and the breeze comes through. So you know you're affected by it, but you also have certain calming quality. And so I kept thinking about this works for me, right? That's how I got to the whole idea of global because it's what the scientists said, the more diversity there is, the biodiversity, the more stable the system is. And that's how I felt what Banyan tree represented. And then when I tried it out in young people, it didn't register at all. And I actually talk about that in the book at the beginning and then also at the end where this recognizing what they feel is a anxiety of simultaneity, meaning they know they live in this world where local, national, global all keep coming at them, but how to find their center. So towards the end of the book, I talk about, you know, this image that a young student in Nairobi Actually, we, we're doing a big project at Columbia called Youth in a Changing World, and Arnav is part of that too. Uh, there are a number of other people who are there. Uh, they're completely comfortable talking across cultures, all of that stuff. And yet, what I sense in that drawing, we do a collective drawing at the end, and this young woman drew a picture of what the future looked like for her. And it was like a steep hill that was just going to go right down. And the first part of the picture was having potholes and old car. And I, I we asked them to explain that. And then she said, you know, I, I and she had tears in her eyes. And she said, My, our parents didn't have a lot. They had potholes in the road. 
old cars, but they kind of had some stability in there. They knew where they were going. Now, with all this stuff coming at us, we have no idea what our future is going to be like. There is no certainty because the change is coming at us so fast. And at that point, I realized that, you know, we of a certain age, individuals, uh, have to really think about this, is that I had the luxury of adding layers to my life. And that's what the book is about. In a way, the way I added layers, subtracted, and then things get fused and something, they're challenged. And sometimes it's like completely disorienting. But I had a lifetime because I came of age when India just became a country. I learned about being part of a nation. Then I come to America as a 17 year old and I learned to express and adopt another family, if you will, and then make my life here. But so that I had a luxury of time, they don't have that luxury. So how, what do I do to help them find the center in this cacophony of pace of change that we find ourselves in? And that is, I think, for me, why I'm so passionate about trying to do what I can through telling my story, I'd never done anything like that, is really to say there is another way. And I recognize that you all have to find a center somewhere. And it is possible to do that. But, um, yeah, uh, I, I mean, I can hope so. I did think it was one of the things that occurred to me is that this book is kind of uh, shaped by, uh, you know, your work as an educator, uh, because there's so much of it is draws from the experience of interacted with and so much of it draws from um you know is uh you know is it's you sort of speaking to students almost you know through the book and so are there any uh, you know are there, what are the what do you think of the central kind of learnings that you would want to impart to students i know this research for the right I think that um, um, one of the things we do at Columbia and where I have the pleasure of being a chair is the Presidential Initiative, which is an MA in Global Thought. A number of my students uh, and other alums are actually online as well, I know. And I would say that part of it is that you have to model that notion of curiosity, empathy for other people and always look at multiple points of view so how do you not get stuck in an ideological debate that is only one point of view and i think that what i learned in that is that partly it has to do with art as well and uh, let me just diverge a little bit to say why i think art is very important in this conversation because uh, uh, majority of my professional career has been spent in art museums as an art historian and all of that but it all began at the cleveland museum when at the age of 21 as a young married woman i ended up in cleveland and i get my first job and the first job was to teach fifth graders from east Cleveland public schools all African-American and from one of the poorest neighborhoods in Cleveland. So one thing I tell people who are really involved with the social justice and activist movement is to say, you know, in this late 60s and early 70s, there was another moment like that in America where because of civil rights, because of other things, people were trying to figure out what to do. And as I work with that, if you don't mind, maybe I should read that little passage, should I? Yes, is that good? Yeah. Uh, just because that will give people a sense of what was going on there. Um, so these are 25 students, and it's the first time. I've never taught in a museum. I didn't know what it's about. Somebody has seen me as a dancer, the head of education at Cleveland. And they said, why don't you come and work with kids? And I said, oh, okay, that sounds good, you know. I was a poli-sci major. I was going to go in IR, but I was always passionate about this culture politics intersection. So um, these students are coming my first day. I said, I thought I was ready when I met my first group of 25 students, mainly black, and almost all of them taller than me. As I welcomed them in the museum lobby, my heart sank. Most looked utterly bored, and some were even snickering and rolling their eyes. Here I was, all up for this big event, well prepared with a complete lesson plan and wearing a special sari. I didn't wear saris all the time, but I did that day, um, staring at a giant wall of disinterest. 
Worried about what to do next, I led them to the Asian art galleries and set them on the floor, took a big breath and asked a question to break the ice. Can you guess where I'm from? Absolute silence. Then a tall boy, clearly the wise guy of the group, snickered. Lady, are you from Mars? Everybody broke into laughter. Nice try, I quipped. Not quite that far away. The class fell silent again. Finally, a petite girl raised her hand. You're not American. You're a foreigner, right? You're right, I said brightly. I'm an Indian. In those days, I really was thinking of myself as Indian rather than Indian American. Hand shot up. What kind of Indian? Are you Navajo or Apache or a, I know, Apache? I answered, not quite. I come from the country called India, halfway across the world from here. The little girl asked, if you're a real Indian, why are those other people called Indians too? It sure beats me, I answered jokingly and then reminded them the original mistake made by Christopher Columbus. One thoughtful fellow spoke up, that's really dumb. After all those years, why are we still making the same mistake? Why don't we come up with a new name? Now you're thinking, that's a really good point, I smiled, because the term Native American was not yet in popular use. None of this was in lesson plan, but I said to myself, the ice has broken. Now is the time to take this to another level. And I gathered the students around the magnificent 11th century Cholan sculpture of Shivanatraj, the one that had caught my eye uh, initially when I got to the museum. So I asked, hopefully, does the sculpture raise questions for you? And now there's no holding back. And people have all kinds of things, and I won't go into all of that. But people say, why does this dude have so many arms? Does arm do a different theme? Is this all about magic tricks? Is this sort of a friendly monster? And so forth and so on. And then we actually started taking the pose and we tried doing different things. And then six weeks later, where they came every week, once a week, for the day with me to explore different kinds of Indian and Asian art galleries. And over the next six weeks, we learned about dance gestures and the iconography of Indian sculptures, explored pathways into various Chinese landscape paintings, studied intended perfections of Japanese ceramics. At the end of six weeks, students surprised me with a performance in front of the Shiva Nataraja and a big poster describing what they had learned about India. As my students learned during their museum visits about parts of Asia that they had never known before, they also taught me an important lesson. By example, they illustrated the communicative power of art, its capacity to be of a particular time and place and to transcend the geographic and historical distances at the same time. I had become interested in political science because of the Vietnam War and believed in the necessity of cultural understanding as a basis for avoiding political conflicts. I talk about that in the previous part of the book. Though my through my students, I realized that museums could be important sites for cultural understanding among diverse groups. By teaching fifth grade, fifth graders, I learned to go beyond the sheer beauty of artworks and become committed to the power of art to engender engagement with unfamiliar forms and ideas. I say that because today there's a lot of questions about restitution, return of objects, uh, what is the meaning of museums, all valid questions. But in that question, I feel that we have to remember that there is a potential of power of art to connect as well. And if anything, I personally, feel, I was just talking about this with some art museum colleagues in a podcast, that if anything, in museums in India, museums in Egypt, museums in Africa and in the global south, they should demand that they see art from other parts of the world, not just to ask for getting stuff that is ours because it can then sit in the basement as we have so much that actually cannot be even taken care of. So let's change the, the discussion to say, if you want parity, what kind of parity? And it should be the parity of access to different kinds of art. Now with Zoom and other things, it's much more possible than before, but there is something about art and education. That's what excited me about going into the museum. And now I keep coming back between art and politics all the time. 
Well, uh, you know, that's we were, when we were talking last week or uh, a few days ago, um, you raised a very interesting point. You said, you know, as you worked as a curator, as an art historian, um, you know, what you said was how nationalistic should we actually be about art? And, you know, we, as you've written in your book so beautifully, uh, there is, uh, you know, art is often treated as an agent of nation building. You know, if you think of Norman Rockwell in America or Bharatanatyam in India, uh, you know, these have contributed to our image of America and of India, of the global image of America and India. So, um, you know, is there something to be said for being, for thinking of uh, art as, you know, outside of those boundaries of, of nation state? You know, I see that Jitish is on the call, uh, one of the more wonderful artists coming out of India and a good friend. And I think that one thing that when I talk to my artist friends and when I encounter art is that art is very, it's messy. It's hard to put it in little boxes. And the truth of the matter is that it also can be a perfect metaphor for this globality that I'm talking about. And part of it is that, yes, it can be used for all kinds of purposes. We know that Napoleon looted objects because it showed his empire. We know that colonialists took things from other parts of the world. Absolutely true. But that is how people used it. We also have to recognize that there are other potential for art. So let's think about nationalism in one category, but not the only category. And what we also need to think about is that nationalism with jingoistic idea takes away the nationalism with some notion of humility rather than hubris. Mm -hmm. And it, it we have to recognize that, that reflectiveness is something that's really missing in our society right now, no matter where you are. And ask yourself, what is the other potential of art? Art also, at least I know, and that's why I wanted to read that passage, is that I know what art can do and let's use that part of power of art and not simply thinking that it's only a product of a particular time, particular place, particular nation, because art also lives across time and place, right? So the same object placed in one place is something, same object in another location is something else, and then same object goes somewhere else, it's something else. So there is reception and there is perception and there is intention. Let's try to recognize all of it. Um, actually, we, we did have a question from Mr. Kalata. Do you mind if I uh, read it out? Uh, the pandemic has indeed been a key opportunity for humanity to reflect on our common ancestry of our existence on isolated branches of a single phylogenetic tree. Uh, what we've seen during this time is the quashing of this possibility by the competing forces to self-preserve the evolutionary instinct for tribalism, the self genome play. Oh, that puts a lot of, uh, uh, yeah. not in your core. I know. Well, you know, I think that we are still in the middle of it. I mean, I would say that, and I talk about this with especially my uh, politically oriented friends a lot and especially in a certain age and they always say oh you're being too idealistic because i think that we're never going to get away from the tribalism and in fact if anything it's an emphasis on that part and my answer to that question goes back to another political philosopher and a philosopher du Wei ming who used to be at harvard then went to beda and is now retired and he wrote very early on, and this was in the early 90s when globalization was just taking place and going full, um, getting ready to go full force in the way we know it today. And he wrote and he said, you know, globalization and balkanization, the tendency to break into small groups are two sides of the same coin. So indeed, as Jitesh, you're talking about that when things actually go the other way, which is that pandemic shows us that we're part of this larger unit called global humanity, we get scared and we want to actually break into smaller and smaller and smaller parts. So it is natural, but both are real. So the way I think about it is the like human being, you know, glasses half and half empty at the same time. And 
either you continue to only focus on the half empty part or you try your best to get that half full part to go a little higher and what i am saying is that i consider myself an idealistic realist in that i recognize that these tendencies are there but i also recognize that if we don't actually push against it if we go not to the better angels of our nature but the worst instincts of our nature we won't have a choice because the kind of crisis, almost every major crisis you think about in the world is going to be global in nature, whether it's pandemics, whether it's climate, whether it's the uh, weapons of mass destruction, you know, these things are massive and we got to have a way to figure this out. So it's possible that the tribalism will continue to play a part, but there have been moments in a way United Nations was born at a time when people felt that world can't afford another catastrophe. So we have to do something. So I am hopeful and especially young people, at least the one I talk to all the time and engage with, they really do understand this. And I recognize that they're probably more privileged than others and so forth and so on. So there's always caveats, but we got to do what we can. So as far as I'm concerned, it's possible that tribalism will reign supreme. So we have to double down and work harder mm -hmm. not to do that, not to have these kinds of hatred and you know, fighting with each other because they're different from us and whatnot. Because I think we have the capacity to do both. Hitler showed us we can we can be hugely destructive, but we also have Gandhi. So what are we going to choose? Um, there's actually a, a very interesting question uh, by uh, from Krishna Priya Jay. Uh, who says, hello, Dr. Desai. Um, really looking forward to reading your book. Uh, one, thing I've noticed, one thing I've noticed about families is the protective instinct. Generally, families tend to save their immediate affinals first. Applying this to the global level, wouldn't this cause strains in international relations? I think it's a very interesting question. So even yeah. if the EU as, you know, as part of this global norm, then, and then the EU sort of you know, in the vaccine, when we're talking about the vaccine, suddenly it became this, you know, very sharply defined block, uh, uh, you know, sorry. You know. No, I mean, I think that what's very interesting is that at least what happened in EU is an interesting example. Initially, the instinct was to lock the borders mm -hmm. and not let people go in and out. Then, as it comes to the next phase right now, they're working much more closely than ever. And there's actually fewer people talking about getting out of EU because there's something about recognizing that maybe if you're going to treat this, you have to treat it in a collective way, whether it's vaccine, whether it's the vaccine passports and what have you. So I do think that there isn't an easy answer to that protective instinct. And I think that initially, as is true in our own body, you know, how the body kind of goes to try to protect yourself, even if, for example, in when you take the first uh, shot of vaccine, that some people said it's almost like reacting to the body is reacting your immune system to protect from the outside element. Then gradually you learn that, okay, this is just one part of it. I have to really learn to do something else. So that's an interesting model to think about. The protective instinct will be there. What will be the next iteration and how do we actually continue to nurture that instinct and not get stuck in, it's sort of, I, I'm, you know, I'm on another board and we were just talking about how pandemic either reminds you that, oh my God, if I can only get back to where I was before. Because initially the feeling is I can't survive. I just have to survive. How do we add to that, say, survive and get better to do more? So that's like not build back better, which is sort of the Biden uh, motto, but at least think about this moment as also the possibility and opportunity to do things differently. So Chinese have a wonderful phrase that actually talks about every barrier, every challenge is an opportunity. 
Can we think about that or is it only too aspirational? It's up to all of us. Um, I think we have time for a couple of more questions. Uh, I, I did, there was an, actually a fantastic question also from uh, Abdul Karim in Singapore. And this is speaking to your role as an educator. And he says, uh, what concrete steps should educate institutions and governments take to make students at all levels understand and appreciate each other's cultures, especially in the multicultural environment? And I think, you know, people from Singapore. Uh, right. I mean, actually, thank you for asking that question because um, you may be aware that OECD did a study and for global competence what does that really mean and it was launched in singapore uh, not surprisingly and afs the international student organization that i am a chair of board chair of we did it with them and they've categorized these ideas of what does global competence mean and how, what are the things you can measure and they talk about curiosity about other then empathy, so willing to put yourself in the other person's shoe, looking at things from another perspective, and then learning about cultures beyond who you are. And these have to be then part of the lesson plan, no matter what you do. So when at the Asian Society, we had started an international uh, education school program in public schools, and these were magnet schools. And so it was whether it was math or literature, you would bring in examples from other parts of the world to actually inculcate in the students that there isn't only one way to think. And that's something that Kriya, uh, that you're part of, and that I have the honor of being part of, one of the reasons I got very excited is that this interval learning bit is not just about interdisciplinarity. It is also to look at ways of thinking about the world differently. And that means to have a more capacious mind because for that expansive belonging, you need that. So you have to start that in school when you were in you know, kindergarten all the way through. And for families, it means who are you engaging with? Who are you socializing with? What kind of books, what kind of TV shows, what do kids read and learn from? And that also means producing more things. I mean, one of the things that I wrote this book for is a number of my literature friends said that there are lots of fictional things about migrant stories, right? Immigration and Jupal Harry comes to mind, amazing story, wonderful story. But there are very few nonfiction books that actually also look at the idea of not just losing one culture and gaining another culture. It's not from and to, but it is and. That is the 21st century reality for many, many people. So therefore, let's get more stories, let's get more films, let's get more things. I now recognize that, for example, White Tiger, because it was on Netflix, so many of my friends in America actually saw that kind of a movie that they might not have seen otherwise. And it's important to, but you have to do that when kids are young, you know, how to expose them to many, many different possibilities. Um, that I think is very important. Um, we have a question from uh, your friend, Paula Mariwala, who says, uh, the world today is uh, polarized, what she puts family in, uh, almost, with little tolerance for differences of any kind. Um, do you see these fractures getting healed uh, in our in your future, if at all? Well, I, I do think that once again, I always say that, that we have these uh, complex opposing forces within us, all of us and in communities at large. The question is, what are you going to nurture and what are you going to stand against? So that, I mean, if you think about India and you think about Sufism, and those of us who have studied the history in the 12th and 13th and 15th century, you recognize that actually when there is some tolerance of difference, out of that emerges other ideas, other cultures, music, 
an, another way of looking at stuff. So there are scholars who have looked at Sufism and Bhakti and the relationship between the two when they come together. So I actually feel, and this is not to be too specific, but I really feel that we need to understand the kind of diversity in India that has existed prior to the arrival of the British and then begin to think about how did societies, cultures, as well as power forces actually accommodated each other. And I think that it is important to recognize that when we come to other religions, that no country has had more diversity of religions than India. Why is that? It's because there is something in the heterodox tradition of the Indic tradition with multiple gods and goddesses and accommodating other people that actually allows you to do that. So let's celebrate the heterodox nature and polyphonic nature of the Indic tradition rather than getting too focused on the narrow definition that actually are no more than 150 years old. And it's important, but that means that we all have to study this. We have to understand what is in our culture so that it's not defined by the narrow forces that only define it one way. And you think that that's all it is to the Indic tradition. So I am hopeful that younger people are going to have to take this by the And they did. They, they are doing it, you know, so let's let's support them. Well, I think there was a kind of, uh, at, least, at least when I was growing up, it was about 20, a while ago now, you know, even in our textbooks, there was a kind of uh, championing of the heterodox tradition in Indian religion, in Islam, and Hinduism, but it really seems to have been subsumed, you know, for political reasons. Right. I know, exactly, because I do think there is something about, and I feel I'm older than you, that actually, right after independence in the first decade, there was a pride that we actually could have many different people coming together, even these states that when World Bank said it was unlikely that India would survive as a country because we had too many, too many religions and too many languages and too many different cultural traditions and the pride that we actually could do it. You know, yes, it was problem, there are plenty of problems, but we held together in some way. Now the reality is, that we also can't be jingoistic about that because it work, takes work. It's like tending to a garden, you know, you've got to prune it, you've got to constantly nurture the values that were at the foundation of where we were. Even then there were problems, I recognize that, but at least it's sort of what in America people have said in the constitution, but all President Barack Obama has said, is that we have to continue to recognize that to work toward a more perfect union, mm -hmm. you need to work at it. You need to tend to it. And it is not a perfect union yet. India is not a perfect nation yet. And if we go the other way, you are actually going to splinter in a way that will take away the idea of a country. So I would hope that we recognize because of this pandemic, take this moment to just stop for a second. If the world didn't come to India's help, how would we feel? And if we don't help each other within our own neck of the woods, how would we feel? Absolutely. Let's not be selfish, you know? That's such a lovely thought actually. And, uh, yeah. um, yeah, I, I think we'll do one more. I know we're over time already. Uh, I'm sorry, but there's been a lot of great questions coming in, and you know, Shakti has been speaking so well. Um, there's a, one question uh, that uh, is asked by an anonymous attendee who says, as president emeritus of the Asia Society, what do you think of the idea of a singular Asian identity? And I know you addressed this in the book, where vis-a-vis -vis Asian Americans and you know how you felt as suddenly not a uh, is there such a thing, given the diversity of this continent and its multiple histories, or does it right. make it only when one is an Asian in a non-Asian country? Right. So that there's a lot in that question. And I encourage people to read the section of the book that actually where I focus on the first big Asian American exhibition that we did at the Asian Society in the early 90s. Um, first, 
of all, I do recognize that even the concept of Asia is a construct, right? It is a construct that comes partly from the West, partly from the various kind of hegemonic forces. And so, yes, it's somewhat artificial. Within the Asian American context, I really feel very strongly that the only thing that unites us as Asian Americans is our American experience. It is how we are perceived by the other and where we come in to expanding the notion of American identity. For the broader Asian identity now, I mean, it started even when I was the president that we really began to think about not just U.S. Asia. U.S. is a country, Asia is not a country. Asia is this big, you know, huge continent and with many, many diverse things. It is worth remembering that there have been interconnections in Asia and actually they were stronger before the Europeans come. It's not just Buddhism, it is trade. Historians have done work on trade in the 15th century, 14th century. And what happens is that once the Europeans come in, they stop the sea train uh, lane traffic and it becomes much more divided and then the inter-Asia traffic changes. So that's a long conversation, we won't go there. But I, my feeling at the Asia Society was that because it started in America, that there was something about the ignorance about the non-Western end of the world, and especially in Asia, where people had, and that's what John D. Rockefeller III, the founder of the Asia Society said, that we had fought wars in Asia, but we know nothing about Asia. So it was in Asia, the geography, not in Asia, the culture, right? And as a result, there was a need and a demand that we need to create better understanding of Asia for Americans. That was the initial impetus. When, by the time I came along, it was very clear that it was not about just educating Americans about Asia. It also was about partnering with Asia and Asians to think about strengthening relationships and partnerships. And if that was the case, then we couldn't be just in America. We needed to be in Asia as well. So it started with Hong Kong, and then I had the privilege of starting the India Center, Korea Center, and we're in the Philippines and elsewhere. Now, what Asia Society is doing, because we also have a center in Switzerland, and they're looking at other locations, is to really think about Asia, the geography, but also Asia as a as a way that the world interacts and try to think about a global organization such as the Asia Society to really think about Asia in the world and what can we facilitate. I think it's complex and hard to figure out, but it is important to recognize that artificial as it might be, we need to build different kinds of communities. So we need to build communities that is a global community, but we also need to build communities that is intra-Asian communities, regional communities. And we need to build communities that are even within our own backyard around the region. All of these kind of are building blocks towards getting to be a more globally oriented uh, humanity. Okay. Uh... Thank you very much. I'm sorry, we don't have time for any more questions, I'm afraid. Uh, but thank you so much, Dr. Desai. It was a real pleasure talking to you today. Huge pleasure reading your book. I wish I had a physical copy so I could hold it up, but uh, unfortunately, it's not already. There you go. How's that? Uh, beautiful book. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Desai. My great pleasure. And if you want to know more, I have a website, all of the programs somebody has asked that I'm doing everywhere are going to be on that website, vishakadesai.com. You can get the book at both through Columbia and through Amazon. Um, so thank you so much. Really, what a great pleasure to have this conversation. Thank you, Vishaka and Prayag, for such a wonderful and enlightening conversation. There was a lot of food for thought in that discussion, and I can't wait to read your book. On behalf of Asia Society India Center and the Korea University, it's been a privilege to host you this evening. I would also like to thank our outreach partners, the Cambridge Society and the LSE Alumni Group, 
For those of you who wish to buy Vishakha's book, there's a link in the chat box which provides details. Before we end, a note for our audiences, Asia Society India Center's upcoming webinar titled Surviving the Surge, How Should India Navigate Through the Second Wave of COVID-19 will be held on May 18th and features Dr. Sachin Balsari, Dr. Ambarish Satwik, and Professor Polly Roy in a panel discussion moderated by Govind Ethiraj. Registration details for the same are in the chat box. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Stay well and good night.